and welcome to Going Off. This is Kaldheim Previews Part 2. I am Chris. I'm Hallie. And I'm Jordan. And we're just going to jump right in with the cards that we've seen this past week. We're going to start off with one of our new planeswalkers, Tyver Kell. Th- this is Nissa Ravane Part 2. This is the elf planeswalker. <laughs> I, I think this card is pretty cool. It does a lot of things that you want an elf planeswalker to do. It draws cards, it makes elf tokens, it lets your elves tap for mana. I think the only question I have about it is whether it's better than Freyalise in an elf commander deck, but I think they're both probably pretty good and can coexist. Yeah, it's interesting that uh, it makes elves tap for black, which is one of the few strikes I can see against it if you're trying to build a dedicated green elves deck. Yeah, but as we've seen how much elves move into black mana... You have a bit more options now. You don't always get locked in green mana with the Freyalis Planeswalker. You actually get some options here as Tribal Elves moves away from green and into green black. I also love the borderless art of Tyvar, where he's just hanging out in a tree and doing this scouting pose. It's very endearing. It looks like he's going to burst into song, and I love it. Agreed. (laughs) Yes. Moving on from Elf Planeswalkers, going into the next round of gods, we've got Essica, god of the tree, who also flips into the Prismatic Bridge. (laughs) The actual creature side for Essica, pretty straightforward in terms of what they do. Vigilant 1-4 that taps for mana. It does give a nice little mana ability to the rest of your legendary creatures, Really where this card gets explosive is on the flip side with the Prismatic Bridge, even if it is abysmal to try to cast. If you have a five-color Super Friends Commander deck, this is the card for you. Yeah. You you want this card in any five-color deck, because who doesn't love just every upkeep getting a creature or Planeswalker card? The next god we have is one of the red gods, Torolf, the god of fury slash Torolf's hammer. Uh, The god side is whenever a creature planeswalker an opponent controls is dealt excess non-combat damage, Torolf deals damage equal to the excess to any target other than that permanent. So if you lightning bolt a 1-1, the extra 2 damage Torolf will deal somewhere else. That's pretty neat, because don't you ever find yourself in a situation where you have a damage-based removal spell... And it's just the only one you have, and it does just a little too much damage. And you could have been pointing that at your opponent's face. Like, I don't know. This is pretty cool. I also like seeing it with the amount of creature damage spells that exist both in this set, but just in general, they've been printed in red recently, where it does a high amount of damage for a low cost, but only hitting creatures or only hitting creatures and planeswalkers. So yeah. this gives you the option of taking out a lowly 1-1 one, one and, I don't know, hitting them in the face for 5 the other side is, in fact, a lightning bolt, but one you kind of have to work for. It it by itself is one in a red to play it as an equipment. It costs one in a red to equip, and then the equipped creature gets plus three plus zero as long as it's legendary. If it's not legendary, it does nothing. Except that it has one in a red, unattached Torolf's Hammer. It deals three damage to any target. Return Torolf's Hammer to its owner's hand. So it's six mana to lightning bolt something, but you can do it over and over again. Yeah, it's a bit clunky in terms of thinking of it as a lightning bolt. While it does a lightning bolt effect, it just there's so much to it that's required of you to actually get the kind of recursion. Yeah, I just like the callback to the Bogard and Hammer, or whatever that original card was. Our next god is Turgrid, god of fright, uh, which is Turgrid's lantern on the other side. And she's very aptly named because she's very scary in Commander. I can't wait to see someone with an Aristocrats deck face off against Turgrid. What you want is you want to build an Aristocrats deck with Turgrid in it and then Grave Pact. So just every time you sack something of yours dies, everybody has to sack something, then you get their stuff. Ooh, I'm writing that down. Oh, that's foul. Yes, I'm doing that. Thank you, Chris. I'm writing that down. No problem. I'm never playing you, Commander. (laughs) And then on the other side, the Artifact... Uh, is tap, target player loses three life unless they sacrifice an online permanent or discard a card, and then three in a black, you can untap it, so you can just keep doing it again. So if you have some kind of infinite mana thing, you just, everybody, sacrifice everything they have, discard their hand, and then die. We've done our section of Norse-inspired gods. Instead, we're going to move on to the Norse-inspired apocalypse with Coma Cosmo Serpent. This is the big beater 
so far for Simic that we've seen. It is three green, green, blue, blue. So not cheap for a 6-6. Six, six. But this legendary creature serpent can't be countered. At the beginning of each upkeep, so not just your own, you're going to make a 3-3 blue serpent creature token named Coma's Coil. And you have the ability to sacrifice another serpent. Choose one of these. Tap target permanent. Its activated abilities can't be activated this turn. Or Coma gains indestructible until end of turn. So you're making 3-3s every single upkeep. And you just have a little bit of control element with using these serpents. Yeah, I'm glad this card exists. Simic really needed another big beater. <laughs> Here's the thing. I'm fine with the beater part of it just because, sure, like that that's kind of what that con color combination does now is they get some crazy big thing. It's the, the first ability where you sacrifice another serpent where you tap target permanent and its abilities can't be activated because you can tap planeswalkers, you can tap lands, uh, at, like in people's upkeeps, and they can't really do anything about it. <laughs> The positive thing is it's unlikely people are going to be making Serpent Tribal. So you're really looking at Serpents being specifically the Coma's Coils from Coma. So hopefully you're not generating enough to completely lock out your opponent. But don't get me wrong, the potential is there. Yeah, I was trying to look up other Serpents that you could play in Commander. And I didn't find a ton of them. The next creature we have is a dragon. We have the pushed red dragon of the set that hopefully ends up seeing constructed play, and I think it will. Goldspan Dragon. It's funny you mention the pushed three f red red dragon because I think that is the card type that I have probably cast the most of in Standard in my time playing Standard. <laughs> <laughs> It's not quite the same as Glorybringer, but it also isn't as aggressive as a lot of the pushed red dragons. Instead, it really rewards medium to big red with its ability to make treasure tokens whenever it attacks or gets targeted for removal or anything along those lines. And it doubles the effect of your treasures. There's already a big red deck that's kind of on the fringes in standard right now. It uses Iron Crag feet to play Ugin, which is pretty gross. <laughs> and... Uh, I don't know. I've, I've played it a little bit. It's a deck that is pretty good in standard because it just hates on Gruul, which is probably one of the best decks in standard right now. And playing it, I found that it has this pretty good control game, but it can kind of struggle to actually close the door because it's so light on threats. But adding a threat like this that is really aggressive but can also help you make more mana so you can eventually cast Ugin seems like it would be a good fit. Speaking of red cards... We have a red counter spell? Question mark. Tybalt's Trickery. This is an instant for one and a red. It says counter target spell. Choose one, two, or three at random, and its controller mills that many cards, then exiles cards from the top of their library until they exile a non land card with a different name than that spell. They may cast that card without paying its mana cost, then they put the exiled cards on the bottom of their library in a random order. It's so weird. The milling part is just really weird. Like, the one, two, three at random, then mill, doesn't have anything else to do with the rest of the card. It's so strange. I love that Mono Red has a counter spell now, and this is the most Mono Red counter spell that I can imagine. I think it's hilarious. I don't know if I like red having a straight up counter spell that doesn't have a way of beating it because your spell is getting countered no matter what, unless you counter the counter spell. I don't know if this sees any play in a deck that is actually trying to play it as a counter spell against their opponent's spells, as opposed to just, I'm going to throw this at one of my own spells to try and combo into something crazy. That sounds much more likely. Getting away from the strangest instant in red I've seen in a long time. We're going to go to an instant in blue with Mystical Reflection. This is an interesting one. I don't know how I feel about it. I see this almost as a way to hose your opponent doing some crazy stuff. Your opponent casts show and tell. In response, you point this at your goat token and say, all right, it resolves. Nice. I see this used more like that. You can do crazy stuff with your own stuff, obviously. The one example I've seen on Twitter is you cast Avenger of Zendikar with the trigger to make all the plant tokens on the stack. You cast Mystical Reflection targeting your Avenger of Zendikar. You get dozens of Avengers of Zendikar that all make their own plant tokens. That's disgusting. And suddenly I see the benefit of Mystical Reflection. The two ways this gets used is to either completely fizzle something impressive or to completely blow out a game. <laughs> I'm here for either of those things. 
Our next card is the World Tree, which is a land. It's the center of all things on Kaldheim. It's good. I mean, uh, controlling six or more lands is surprisingly achievable in just about any magic format these days. Yeah, unless you are playing super aggro mono red sort of decks, many games you'll end up with six lands. Even if you aren't planning on getting the ridiculous activation out of it, just having a chromatic lantern on a land is pretty good. Especially considering it's not legendary, despite being named. I'm not super sold on the activate ability, especially considering in my head I'm going, wait, that's just a door to nothingness. But it doesn't win me the game immediately. I still could lose. Technically, yes, but it'd be kind of tricky if you're building your deck like a commander god tribal deck. There's a lot of gods nowadays. Yeah, I, it's definitely a commander effect. The, the silly combo I've seen people point out is play commander, you throw out some mana rocks early, this comes down some point in your first five turns, and then on turn five you cast Chromatic Ori, tap your mana rocks and this, and Wooberg, and get all the gods. <laughs> turn six, here's every god that exists in magic. Please have fun for the rest of the game. That covers all the stuff we wanted to go real in-depth about. We do have a bunch of other cards that have come out over the past week that we want to just very quickly touch on. We're going to start with Maskwood Nexus, which is an artifact for four. So it's Birthing Bows that's better and also has Arcane Adaptation stapled onto it. The big reason I wanted to bring this up is because uh, if you cast Maskwood Nexus and then activate the World Tree, you get to put every creature in your deck onto the battlefield because they're all gods. Gross. <laughs> Our next card is Eradicator Valkyrie, an angel berserker for two black black. This creature reminds me a lot of Rankle from Throne of Eldraine, which has seen a lot of play in Standard. And I think this card is similarly good and maybe better than Rankle in some situations. And Rankle sees a lot of play. We've got Ascendant Spirit up next, which is essentially a snowy figure of destiny. Here's the kicker, because it's basically a repeatable kicker kind of thing with four snow mana. If Ascendant Spirit's an angel, you're going to put two 1-1 one, one counters on it, and it gains whenever this creature deals combat damage to a player, draw a card. And you can just keep doing that. I like that we're still doing ability counters outside of Akoria. I like that this is a thing. Next up, we have Quakebringer, a giant berserker for three red red. I don't know if this card is going to see play in standard, but I would like to remind everyone that there are a surprising number of giants in standard. There's Bone Crusher Giant. There's Beanstalk Giant. So that Giant Clause, when this is in the graveyard, is surprisingly easy to enable. As an old school Legacy Burn player, this might be my favorite card in the set. We have Carter Doom Scourge, who's a legendary demon berserker for two black red. I just want to throw this in there because this feels like just exactly the sort of mean thing that any sort of Rakdos commander deck wants to do. Finally, we have Weathered Rune Stone, which is a two mana colorless artifact. Seems a little bit like Graph Digger's Cage. This is the kind of magic card I love because as soon as I read it, I can immediately think of three to four friends that I can't wait to put this in a deck against just to watch their faces fall. Uh, Non-land permanence is a big deal since Graph Digger's Cage was creatures specifically. It's one mana more than Graph Digger's Cage, which in older formats is a big deal and might hold this back from seeing like legacy play. But in stuff like Standard, having this kind of effect around can sometimes just be a nice little safety valve. So yeah, that will do it for week two of Call Time Previews here on Going Off. I've been Chris. I've been Hallie. I've been Jordan. And we will see you all next week. Bye.